Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome again so to the second part of uh, the NC Talks today with the interview. Uh, again, thank you, uh, Susan Kearns, thank you, Paula Almeida, um, Michael Lim, and Jason Wong, uh, Greg Hinson, uh, uh, Robert Donald, uh, and of course, uh, Mustafa Kumadi. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for. Uh, talking to us, to the uh, Navigation uh, Commission this morning. Uh, it was a very good uh, talk. Uh, let uh, me ask you, let me first ask you if you enjoy engaging with the Navigation Commission. Yes, of course. <laughs> I enjoyed very much listening to the three presenters this morning. Chapeau to all of you. Uh, very informative and very enjoyable. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, as you see, we are uh, trying to establish uh, new communication ways with, uh, with everyone. And please uh, always feel free to contact us at any time. We're uh, exchanging emails and uh, phone numbers. And uh, yes, it, that's good for the aviation community, whatever we're doing. And uh, of course, we will reach better consensus when we get uh, more people involved. And uh, today, that was a good uh, discussion regarding competence-based training, and uh, you are uh, experts so from different countries, different regions in the world, and that makes our, uh, our job uh, yeah, improving better and better. Thank you very much. Okay, let me start asking you questions, and please uh, feel free to, to uh, comment them, to respond to them. Uh, don't ignore them, please. I need some answers. <laughs> and the first one is, uh, so regarding the CBT, of course, so the competency-based methodology is, uh, is a high standard to assure successful development of uh, effective training programs. Uh, what is the current status of uh, CBT, both as a means and as a standalone method? Paula, please. Yes, thank you. Th thanks for this question. As I mentioned before in my presentation, competency-based <coughs> training is fully based on instruction system design which is an international standard and CBT is not specific only to, to aviation so as a method it has been validated by many international researchers and academics now I wouldn't really say that it can stand alone by itself since simply because CBT needs to be and always is linked to the main outcome and the outcome is applied in the work environment but obviously the main outcome is actually the continuous learning and development of professionals so I would say that the current status is that CBT continues to grow as a highly effective training methodology. It's strongly tied to performance and it contributes quite effectively to professional development. Mm -hmm. um, I'll defer to Suzanne who works in this area all the time in Canada. But what I can say is that, uh, as I alluded to earlier, in the maintenance side of the business and in the um, the trades as opposed to university uh, or even pilots to a certain extent. Unfortunately, we do not see people recognize the value, but it has not yet been implemented in a meaningful way. Suzanne? Yeah, so just following up on, on both Paula and Robert's points, I think the academic community has done the foundational work to sort of validate that this can be a path forward for aviation training, that there is sufficient uh, body of evidence to support some of that movement. But uh, as Robert is uh, very well versed in here in Canada, unfortunately, um, the entire aviation community is still very dependent on the regulatory structure that defines licensing criteria. So instead of teaching people to become the most competent professionals uh, using the most modern tech technology in the most efficient way possible, sometimes we are teaching people based on the licensing criteria being the outcome. So there are these sort of built-in inefficiencies. Uh, we're not motivated to do things in fewer hours because many training organizations charge by the hour. So their entire business model is linked to hours. So shifting away from hours towards a focus on doing things in the most efficient uh, way possible to produce job-ready um, students, it's not something that we're as as it doesn't really reflect what we're doing in the real world practice, but we have aspirations that it will in the future. 
Yes, thank you. Uh, some, some training programs do not fit the competency-based methodology. For example, uh, leadership and management programs. Um, how could we reconcile the distinct between the need for leadership and management training and IKEA's focus on competency-based training? Okay, th th thank you again very much for this question. Now, first of all, all training that have a measurable outcome can use competency-based training. Leadership and management competencies are, as you mentioned, very much needed. And you're right, it's easy to assume that there is a certain gap between leadership and management training and the actual performance on the job. There is, after all, so much information related to leadership and management, and this needs to be connected to the work environment. But I believe that competency-based training can definitely be the bridge that makes this connection. In my presentation, I spoke about the importance of analyzing the job so to answer your question, the CBT methodology can ensure that leadership and management is contextualized to the correct specific environment. At JATO, for example, we have several competency-based programs which train leadership and management competencies. For example, safety management systems, emergency response planning, human factors, fatigue risk management, and many more. And the IKEA Global Aviation Training Unit has an entire array of capacity building courses which train leadership and management. One example is the Training Managers course. It's a competency-based course. So to, to conclude my answer, I would say that leadership and management can definitely fit the competency-based methodology. So, please. And just, just, just support what Paul is saying. Any course that we're taking, somebody <coughs> says to them, now let me teach you how the jobs are really done. You know, now that you're out of the classroom, this is the real world, sort of this disconnect. The concept that what we teach in a classroom doesn't have any linkages to the actual job, I think is, is a false concept. And, and I think Paula did a really good job of articulating that really what we're doing is that we should have all courses that are aligned and directed on a path to which I think fundamentally what this would be training. I would also support the idea that leadership and management should be competency. Uh, Mr. Lim? Oh, you need to unmute your microphone, Dr. Lim. Uh, okay, based on what we have done, uh, we think that the issue complement each other very well. Uh, but we do have several, or we do have many courses that are not competency. For example, working with IKO, we actually come up with two packages to train new director generals. One on aviation safety, one on aviation security. Because at the very high level, they are teaching people principles, transference skills, uh, it's quite, it's not a technical thing like general to the rest of the thing. Uh, to the COVID-19 outbreak, uh, the, the trend seems to focus more on distance learning and virtual training. Uh, can you explain how COVID is challenging training? Oh, yeah. Jason, you want to share what we have done, the difficulties we face? Uh, okay, maybe I'll, I'll share a little bit of using uh, three methods of, of uh, online learning to, to overcome <laughs> the COVID situation. Now we are using a video conferencing software to conduct a live lesson. And in fact, that is, uh, we feel that the easiest way to convert a classroom-based lesson <laughs> to an online lesson. <laughs> And the second type is the asynchronous type of uh, online learning. So basically, uh, we are using, uh, or it can also be a screencasting software to, to uh, record the instructor's teaching. Students from over the world can uh, access the learning system at any point of time, regardless of the time zone. And the third 
model we are using is actually a hybrid of both systems. So uh, we are recording some of the instructors teaching so that uh, people in different time zones can assess it. And then we uh, complement it by having like a one hour of uh, video conferencing uh, session so that even if they are from different time zones, they can still lock on, lock on to the video conference at a common time and they can ask questions uh, with the instructors and then they can interact with the rest of the participants as well. So. Uh, um, we thought that this is a quite effective way of uh, learning and reaching out to, especially when um, travel restriction is uh, not lifted. And then even within the country itself, uh, the country might not be uh, traveling freely within the country might not be an easy task as well. Yeah, so this is one of the things that we are doing. Thanks, Jason. Thank you. Uh, Mustafa? Yeah, uh, just also to share with you my experience with the, the virtual classrooms. Uh, I was in uh, uh, Morocco in March to deliver an EKO course, and uh, three days before the delivering the course, so everything was uh, shut down. So all, I mean, half of the participants were uh, thinned out, and then uh, we had to get everything uh, in, uh, you know, in another way, so basically, yeah, we have done it. But the main, main, main question is, we have to. I mean, we need to make sure that future courses that are going to be delivered distance learning. There are some that will be instructor led. That means the instructor is delivering the course uh, through the web, and there are some that will be uh, asynchronous. But there should be uh, some uh, kind of guidance to the instructors to make sure that everybody is doing the same because. The most important thing is the, the learning part. It's not the teaching part. We may be teaching and they are not learning. This is my concern. So basically, the, the point here is, okay, we need to make sure that we have, uh, uh, I mean, a uh, very good level of fairness to the trainees, those who are going to be in the classroom and those who are going to be uh, on the learning of the classroom. Uh, also, as I have discussed with uh, Diego and his uh, team, and we found out that there are some courses that can never be, uh, uh, you know, on uh, distance learning or the your classrooms. Yeah. Courses where we have uh, a strong attitude that needs to be uh, tested and need to be assessed, uh, we cannot do this on a virtual classroom. It has to be physical classroom. So, yeah. Uh, challenges are there. Uh, there are many challenges that bring opportunity, as mentioning before. The presentations and have someone talking on the microphone and then said, yeah, this is distance learning. No, no. There is an, uh, still uh, the techniques and the rules for the assessment, the formative assessment, and so on should be there. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so what are the current challenges related to supporting, attracting, educating, and retaining professionals within the aviation sector? And how can these challenges be addressed? Sure, I can, I can speak to that. So several of us support um, ICAO's NGAP program, NGAP being the next generation of aviation professionals. And there's a really really amazing network of colleagues from around the world who have dedicated and volunteered their time to think about what that means and how to best support them. But I think uh, conveying some of those messages, if you think about the three pillars, so attracting people into aviation, what makes aviation attractive to young people, a lot of it is disciplines that maybe we haven't worked with in aviation before, things like marketing and recruitment, uh, outreach techniques, uh, how do we Think about parallel disciplines like STEM, like science, technology, engineering, and math, which has done a really excellent job of integrating in uh, classrooms and summer camps around the world. Um, can we um, combine aviation into some of those pre-existing programs? But then once we've attracted people into the aviation field, the next piece of that is education, which is really where the competency-based education aspect comes. Uh, I can tell you for the University of Waterloo, where I the 
applications to join our program have increased 50% every year for the past four years. So I feel that the emphasis on attracting people to aviation has actually been pretty effective, that we've seen um, in the past four years a lot more people be interested in joining aviation. But the challenge is we are at capacity in our educational system. And so this is where you can't just focus on one pillar. You can't just focus on attracting people. You have to think about how do we innovate education as well. And that's where we look at competency-based education using the most efficient tools to produce the most job-ready people possible when they are finished. And then the third pillar of that is retention. Retention also within academic programs. So historically in pilot training programs, it's very normal to have attrition rates of 25, even 50% of people who start the program do not successfully complete the program. So how can we better retain them within the educational program? And then beyond that, once they've started a job, I know of many of my former students who, for one reason or another, whether it was pay or family life or um, not really understanding the dynamics of what that profession really meant when you're living in it every day, that they weren't retained in that sector. And that involves aspects of things like how do we support diversity and inclusion? Our sector hasn't historically um, been the most diverse. We haven't been the most inclusive. We have a very small percentage of women and, and minorities in, in different aspects. So, so we need to think about very strategically how to support those three pieces. And retention, I think, is especially critical because um, if we lose somebody after they started a job, that all of those touch points, all of those investments of effort that maybe air shows they were exposed to, summer camps, uh, activities as a student that made them choose that aviation career, and then all of the energy and investment of the educators to prepare them to enter that workforce. And you can imagine how sad it is when they choose to leave our sector at the very end before really engaging with our field. So um, both competency-based education to make our training as effective, job relevant as possible, really clearly defined steps in that step ladder. So a lot of the time people making decisions about aviation careers are 16, 17 year old kids who may not know anything about the industry. We haven't really held their hand in the past to help them understand how to make their way along that journey. Um, and then sort of education as efficient as possible. And then, like I said, as well, retention, that we need to think about really investing and in understanding how to keep them in our field once they've made their way along that journey. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, how could we resolve the funding uh, issue for training of uh, NGAP, uh, the new generation of uh, aviation professional, especially at the scale numbers are required? And in your, in your opinion, do you think it's the right time to invest more in the future of aviation training? So I'm sure some of the colleagues have excellent insights in this as well but i can tell you at the beginning of this year sustain itself over the next 15 or 20 years we're greater than our global capacity to train them so so we were in a point in our industry where it was a critical challenge that if we don't figure out how to train people and have them become competent more quickly and more effectively then it's going to be more difficult for us to keep our schedules going to maintain security and maintain efficiency of operations the COVID-19 pandemic has caused immense hardships around the world. It's been devastating for so many different reasons, but it also creates a challenge where for the first time we really have a pause in aviation. And I think the most sort of forward looking thing we can do during our pause is to say, how can we use this time when things have stopped to innovate, to change things and to really rethink the way we've done things historically to set ourselves up for the most sustainable future possible. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Suzanne. So, we'll, uh, well, with, with the lockdown and uh, and social distancing, it's a challenge to enable people to continue with uh, with training. So, for example, ATM training. Uh, how can we do uh, simulator training remotely and effectively, or is it even possible? Greg, please. Yes, indeed. The, for a number of training activities, um, the tendency to shift to distance learning seems to be quite obvious. Whenever you go into practical training, it's obviously slightly different and uh, dependent uh, on the technology you have available. So the short version um, the answer to your question is, is it possible? The answer is yes. Um, today we do have generations of simulated, uh, so the technology is not necessarily the main issue. Uh, the main difficulty is how to actually drive the training process. It's something to do with the methodology. Um, technology is not the issue. Methodology is the one we need to think about significantly. Um, when you're looking at a 
theoretical lesson delivered by an instructor, um, it's quite straightforward. Whereas if you're looking at a situation where you have a coach and who is providing sort of real-time guidance to a student, um, that means far more interaction and less participants, but far more interaction and for which the uh, methodology has to be clearly matured. So the answer is yes, it is possible, but there's still a lot of work to do to make sure this is done correctly. Um, today I have had the opportunity to see the way our friends from the Swiss ANSP do it. They do it, it works well. Um, the Germans also have a variation of technology which makes this possible. Um, we each have our own developments. Some are, let's say, more effective than others, but it definitely is an option and we have to drive down that road. Thank you, Craig. Uh, I have uh, Robert Donald and uh, Michael Lim would like to come on this, please. Thank you, Nabil. I'd just like to come back to some of the points made by Jason earlier and Suzanne. In terms of capacity, um, in Canada, we need 55,000 workers in the next five years, and we're only graduating 14,000 during that time period. So if we keep repeating what we have done to date, and other jurisdictions are the same, ICAO publishes data and IATA and everybody else, we are not training enough people now. Um, and yes, we are attracting them, but we don't have the capacity in our education system to absorb them. All the hmm. more tragedy when, as Suzanne said, we lose some partway through. Um, coming to what Jason alluded to, uh, COVID and the training that SAA is doing, our colleges, the ones we work with who teach the license program, were at an enormous disadvantage when this hit because they had been prohibited from using online and all of a sudden had two weeks to go online with this. So they are doing their best. They are using hybrid training. Uh, they are recording professors giving a lecture and then, or using existing online tools. Uh, Suzanne has developed an amazing human factors program online. <laughs> I encourage all of you to look at it. Um, so they use combination of that, but one would hope, uh, and then they go have live classroom sessions where the professor is there to answer questions and discuss the materials that the students have presumably looked at ahead of time. But clearly, we need to get much better at this, and I don't know if JAA, Paula, or SAA, or Greg, or others have done more work on this, but Canada was from a standing start to trying to deliver online. And hopefully what this will teach us is, and our regulators, that it is a effective way to teach people, that we move to competency-based, high-level performance objective, we will keep them interested, passionate, and we'll train them faster and more effectively. Yeah, I'm, I'm, Robert, you make, you make some very good points, and I'm glad that you connected again to, to the competency-based uh, topic, because this is the main topic of our discussion today. Because I, I can safely say that if our methodology wouldn't be competency-based, the effects of this whole coronavirus uh, crisis situation could have been quite drastic for, for us as a training organization. But because our courses are developed using the competency-based methodology, and we do have so much experience and expertise in online and distance learning, we could actually quickly move to other delivery modes. So we, we, we actually easily adapted to, to virtual training during this period. And, and right now, most of our courses have been converted and, and they're ready to be delivered online, like virtual uh, live sessions. So currently we're running both public virtual courses with mixed audiences, but also on-demand closed sessions for organizations all over the world. And we're also starting with one-on-one -on -one sessions with the instructor and also virtual customized programs. So I, I believe this trend will actually result into a very effective tool to training. Can, can I build on what Paula has just said mm -hmm. as well? So I think the beauty of uh, competency-based training is that it really um, 
dissects all the knowledge, skills and attitudes into the small little components and they really differentiate what is uh, suitable to be tested in the classroom and what is suitable to be tested in, in the operational environment. And because of that, uh, we are able to shift those that can be taught in the classroom uh, and those knowledge that can be uh, that is didactic and can be shifted to the online version. Okay, but whatever that is uh, more explicit, for example, like really controlling, uh, giving guidance to the aircraft will still be limited to the simulators itself. So what we are going to do is uh, we are not going to shift everything onto online. So what we, we are going to do is to dissect those that are going to be taught in the classroom can still be uh, ongoing at this period where the trainees cannot go back to the academies to use the simulators. So once uh, maybe the situation has improved, we are going to go back to the simulators to conduct whatever that is not being uh, conducted online. Yeah, so there's this beauty of CBT that can differentiate between what can be conducted in the face-to-face -face in theory format and then what can be uh, taught in the simulators. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have uh, Michael has been waiting for a long time. Uh, and then Greg and then uh, we have unfortunately to finish. <laughs> now, we are not able to do our simulator training uh, offline or uh, uh, remotely. But what we are starting to do is that uh, because there are not, there's not, not enough business, there's not, not enough uh, practice for the uh, approach. So we bring them back as, as, as watchers and train the entire watch together in lieu of the operational training. So we are trying to see how much simulator training do, do, do they need as a watch and how much this uh, can compensate for the actual life management of uh, flights. So we are going along that way. Thank you. Um, That's okay. sorry. A double double click would help. Uh, so yes, just to add on to Michael's comment, um, indeed the, the context is such that there is a, a huge potential to provide some kind of practical training for those uh, controllers out there and who do not have the activity now and could take the opportunity to train or maintain their their competencies. Um, the, the, the tendency to turn to uh, simulation or online simulation is obvious, but sometimes complex. There's another option which we've started to develop and which I believe has a significant potential is to look at the area of serious games and the number of areas in which the serious games, if they're well done, of course, uh, can provide, uh, let's say, a very uh, user-friendly approach to keeping your mind uh, spinning on a given subject. And um, sometimes it takes significant engineering to put together a good serious game, to make it very really serious. <laughs> but it's uh, actually a tool which you can play with online, which takes away the time pressure, takes away the distance problems, etc. cetera. And uh, we have that experience and works. refers to one of the previous comments of questions is the fact that when looking at distance learning, um, the, the, there is also an issue linked to, if you compare distance learning to face-to-face uh, -face learning, face-to-face -face learning means dedicated time, dedicated shifts where you have to travel to wherever to go and attend the course, or have an instructor come in with a given preset timetable. Whereas when you go into virtual distance learning, you can possibly subdivide your training, uh, let's say, program into smaller slots, and which can possibly easy easier to fit into your operator's access to training to people who would not have access otherwise. Um, there's obviously the economic aspect uh, with the travel expenses, etc. So it brings the, the, the price of the training down, makes it more accessible that way, but it's also more accessible because it's more adapted to the rostering. I hope that brings in a, a different focus as well. Thank you. I'm, um... Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I th think we had a very good discussion today. Um, so, um, I have, well, someone is asking, Mustafa, Mustafa, you would like to add quickly something? Uh, um, please unmute um, your microphone. Again, yeah. V yes. Very quick. It was mentioned by uh, Susan, but uh, we did come back to it. In fact, as part of the CBT, we also have the level of exposure for the skills because uh, the the uh, the I mean 
the competency is is directly linked to the level of exposure. So if the person has a, a, I mean, very good exposure, same competencies as if he's in the airplane and so on. So that level of uh, exposure is also very uh, important for acquiring uh, competence. Thank you. Thank you, Mustafa. Thank you, everyone. Okay, and uh, I hope to see you uh, next time in another ANC talk. We keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you very you. much. It was Thank, a you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Have a great day, brother. It's been interesting. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.